Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to be here, the privilege of being able to take in what we're going to be able to listen to today. And uh, I pray that you would bless it. I pray that it would be a help. I pray that it would um, truly help us in our thinking about what we're engaging with in our world and in our society. So uh, bless today, and we'll give you the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dr. Bach? Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Man, oh, man. Dealing with a remnant over here. I think there's been a partial rapture or something. Anyway, um, and I hate to inform you, but we've been left behind. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, it, it's a pleasure to have you join us for our cultural engagement chapel. We are, this is going to be installment number three of the Oh My Apologetics series. Uh, we've covered Genesis and Exodus, and now we're leaping to Deuteronomy. And Gordon Johnson is our, uh, is our uh, expert. But before we do that, let me give you a couple of announcements that I want to make. Um, there is going to be a student dinner uh, coming up. Uh, and you can see on the slide there, it's April 17th. It's with Robert McFarlane. It's our Faith and Work student dinner. And he is the author of this book called Dear Boss, What Your Employees Wish You Knew which extended means, uh, dear pastor, what I wish you knew about the people that you uh, preach to and what their work is like. And so he's gonna come visit us. This has been a, this has been a best-selling uh, workplace book. So we're real excited to have him. That's on uh, April 17th. And I mean, we're even gonna have a fajita meal. So I mean, what more could you want? And then uh, let me also uh, note for you the internships that are available at the Hendricks Center. We have five internships that we run on a semester by semester basis that run for a year at a time, one in leadership, one in cultural engagement, one related to giftedness, one related to the events that we put on, and then one related to use of media. So if you're looking for an internship, and uh, I, my understanding is, is that some of you have that dilemma in your academic career, uh, we'd be more than glad to host you. Applications are available, and we'd love to have you be a part uh, of that with us. So with that, how did you get into this gig? I got drafted. I think you drafted Bob before. Yeah, and, and you were interested out. in this area before before we before we concocted this little oh, scheme that we've yeah. got going now. So how how did how did that work? Well, I think that uh, 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 I came up with this idea of lions, tigers, and bears, and you like that. Mm -hmm. And we went from there. We went from there. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, our our goal today is to work through some slides with you uh, that relate to how Deuteronomy is understood in the public square. We're waiting for those slides to come up, and uh, and and talk our way through kind of the background of the way Deuteronomy is seen. Let's, let's go ahead and start while they're doing that. Um, tell me a little bit about sure. how, uh, about how, um, how Deuteronomy is seen. So uh, as evangelicals, we hold to the historicity of Deuteronomy that Moses wrote it, or at least the, the core of it, uh, and that uh, it dates to about the middle or the late part of the second millennium BC. 1400, 1200, someplace around there. Uh, but uh, that's not uh, how minimalist or mainstream scholars view it. They view it as being written late, about 600 BC, um, uh, about a thousand years later than Moses, and uh, they don't view the events as historical or Moses. They view Moses as legendary. Okay, so uh, so we're going to walk walk through that with you just to introduce you the theme. We when we did the first one, we connected it to the Wizard of Oz, and we've been Ozing ever since. So we just wanted you to see that this <laughs> one is called Treaties, Covenants, and Moses. Oh my, and. Uh, I'm not quite sure how you ended up being the Tin Man and I ended up being the Scarecrow, but I'll let we'll let we'll let someone else <laughs> dig up the the roots of where that comes from. Um, it's at least it's not Dorothy. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so so let's 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 dive in. So um, the approach of conservative evangelicals, obviously, the historical Moses and the historical covenant is that Moses. Uh, as you said, somewhere in the 1400s to 1200s, there's a d discussion about what the exact date is. Um, uh, 
uh, is responsible for obviously obtaining the law and the covenant mosaic covenant relationship that uh, that Israel had with God. Um, talk a little bit about how Deuteronomy fits into that. Sure. Uh, Deuteronomy is the renewal of the covenant. The Israelites made covenant with Yahweh at Sinai. Right after they came out of Exodus, we hold the Exodus to be a real historical event, Sinai to be historical. And about 40 years later, Moses renewed covenant uh, with, uh, or Yahweh renewed covenant with Israel at Moab. In Deuteronomy, the structure of Deuteronomy is very much like structure of ancient Near Eastern treaties as was Exodus 19 to 24 at Sinai as well. So that's why we're talking about treaties, covenants, and Moses. Okay. We're going to be looking at ancient Near Eastern treaties, how those helps us understand Mosaic covenant and what that implies about historical Moses. Okay, and the two dates that we're dealing with are either 1450 B.C. or 1250 B.C., right. and that relates to the use of numbers in the Old Testament and that kind of right. thing. Right, either the early or the late date within evangelical circles. Okay, so um, so just to show that this is not just private knowledge tucked away in a corner somewhere, um, why, why is knowing this significant? Well, our culture, of course, uh, they know about Moses and Sinai, but they don't view it uh, uh, widespread, they don't view it as historical. Uh, the Exodus is, is viewed as myth. Uh, God's revelation at Sinai is viewed as mythological. The covenant with Israel at Sinai is viewed as mythological, and Moses is viewed as legendary. So when we have these Moses movies that come out, you know, Christians, we go to it, and we get sometimes get disturbed that they didn't quite keep to the biblical script. Well, in their mind, they don't mind not keeping to the biblical script because in their mind it's legendary and mythological to begin with. And so they're just kind of writing their own story on it. But you'll even see this reflected in Newsweek time every, uh, every year about asking the question, is Moses and the Bible true? Uh, and so we really are the minority in our culture that, that takes the biblical covenant and Sinai seriously. Okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, the minimalists a little bit. Um, you've got some pictures and names and folks here, and what do they hold? Sure. So mainstream scholars, we typically refer to them as minimalists because they're going to hold to a very minimum of, of the Bible being historical. And what they're going to argue was is that Hebrews uh, never were in Egypt. They're going to argue they were Canaanites and always Canaanites, indigenous to Canaan, never were in, he in, in Egypt, that there was never an Exodus, there was never a Sinai, never a Moses. They're going to argue that those are traditions that were created centuries later, and in an evolutionary model, the different, the different traditions started piling up. Uh, so the revelation of the law to Moses, they're going to argue, is about the 10th century, about the time of David or Solomon. Uh, the Exodus from Egypt was a tradition that arose about the 9th century. This is about five centuries later where the Bible puts it, but they're going to argue that these were created. These stories were created. And then finally, they're going to argue that Deuteronomy and God's covenant with Moses, they're going to date that to 621 B.C., time of Josiah, I mean, just a couple of decades before Jerusalem falls. So they're not going to view the book of Deuteronomy as coming from Moses at all. They actually argue that Hilkiah the priest, priest fabricated it and claimed, uh, tried to pass it off as coming from Moses. So they have a totally different approach. Uh, to Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, than we do. And you don't have to know all the details, but at least you need to un understand a little bit of the basics of where people are coming from. Your next door neighbor that comes to a liberal church probably is more adept at, at, at this than you are in terms of knowing the background. So we just want to help you understand when people look at you when you talk about Moses uh, and, and Sinai, why they sometimes glaze over uh, with uh, uh, their, their eyes glaze over with this. So let's talk about some of the people who are responsible for, for minimalism. Uh, you've got pictures here of four sure. in particular. Israel Finkelstein, he's an archaeologist, University of Tel Aviv, uh, uh, Donald Redford, uh, William Deaver, and then Philip Davies. Philip Davies is part of the Sheffield Copenhagen School, uh, historian. Uh, so these are uh, a cadre of archaeologists and historians uh, and when you go to Barnes and Nobles, the bookstore, they're going to be the ones really they're going to be populating and pushing uh, that model. Uh, Mysteries of the Bible uh, that you're going to see on TV, they're going to be the talking heads typically. And they're the people that are in the, uh, uh, the public square in terms of pushing the minimalist view. All right. So um, let's see if I can get this to move ahead. There you go. There's, what in the world is that? Okay, well, this is, our, this is our typical fish story. Okay. You can see the guy telling years <laughs> later, telling about how big the fish was, and then his friend on the left is looking at the actual <laughs> size of the fish. And this is kind of the way the minimalists approach it, that there may have been a core of events that might have happened. Uh, 
But as the centuries went on, they became fabricated and exaggerated, and now we have the biblical portrait. So they're going to argue that, that this is the true minimum, this is the true history, and then this is what the Bible presents. So we're going to push back on that, because we're going to argue that we should be able to take the biblical history seriously. And how are you going to do that? So uh, in the 20th century, a lot of the discussion changed uh, from the battle lines between evangelicals, conservatives, and mainstream scholars with the archaeology. Now I mentioned some of the archaeologists have been pushing the mainstream, but one of the most important archaeological discoveries have been texts, ancient Near Eastern treaties. And uh, in the last century, almost 100 ancient Near Eastern treaties have been discovered all throughout the ancient Near East, uh, from east to west, from the third millennium all the way down to the first millennium. And they have different form and different structure. And what's most interesting is that the Mosaic Covenant, the literary structure of the Mosaic Covenant, both in Exodus and Deuteronomy, seem to fit the literary structure of, of late second millennium BC treaties. These weren't written in English, These were they? These are not written in English. No, what, what language? Well, they're written in cuneiform, for Can, the most part. Cuneiform, that's not a form of English. No, it's not a form of English. <laughs> okay. so, so you can see some pictures of it. The, the middle one, we're actually going to talk about just a little bit, so-called eternal treaty, between the Hittite king Hattusili III and Ramesses II. It's actually on display, or at least a replica is on display in New York at the UN. It was the first known uh, international treaty between uh, great powers. But these were written in cuneiform, uh, uh, Akkadian, Assyrian, also Hittite. And so they're all throughout the ancient Near Eastern world. You do your devotions in Akkadian, don't you? Uh, Hittite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, seriously, you have done some work in, in studying some of this right. material. Well, I spent a sabbatical year. Seven years ago, I went to Chicago. I'd been working on Hittite before because of the interest on this. And so I went to Chicago for a year and studied Hittite under Tail Vandenhout. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Okay. So this is the part of the world that we're talking about. So uh, help so, us with this Okay, map. so here's a map of where these ancient Eastern treaties that, uh, that we want to compare with the Mosaic Covenant uh, are found from east to west. Sumer, Babylon, Assyria. You can see Hadi, the Hittites. That's modern-day Turkey. Uh, and they're all spread out. Uh, and they go from the third millennium to the first millennium. Now, the minimalists are going to want to associate Mosaic Covenant with the Assyrian treaties from the first millennium, about 600, 700 BC. We're going to argue that can make a case for connection with the Hittite treaties about 1300 BC, 13 or 1400 BC. Okay. And so, what do these treaties show us? Okay. So, when the scholars looked at the treaties, what they found over these uh, 3,000 years, what they found was continuity. All treaties have got three core things. They all have stipulations, commands. They all have uh, 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 curses uh, for violating uh, uh, the treaties. And then they all appeal to divine witnesses, the, 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 the vassal, the subordinate. Uh, is under the watchful eye of the divine witnesses in, in the polytheistic system. So all treaties in the ancient Eastern world have got those three, but some treaties have got other elements, historical prologue, re uh, uh, rehearsing the history, some have got blessings, and some have other elements. And so scholars are actually able to tell where they're from, what period they're from, in terms of aligning them up by the, by the structure of these, because they change geographically and chronologically. The biblical materials actually align themselves most closely with the Hittite treaties from the late second millennium, which puts them in the time period of where the Bible, that's the same basic time period where the Bible puts Moses in Egypt. So these are like fingerprints. These basically. are like fingerprints, that's yeah. right. It's, it's not unlike uh, uh, cars, you know, mm -hmm. different cars from different countries or different time periods. You can tell where a car was made. You know a Mustang wasn't that's made exactly today. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, some Mustangs some, are. Yeah, that's but right. Uh, the original. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, um, so, um, so what type, so you already suggested this, what type of ancient Near Eastern treaties do Mosaic Covenant materials mostly um, resemble? So, uh, the two basic, the, where, where the discussion is, are they most like the Hittite treaties of the second millennium? or the Assyrian treaties like the first millennium. Uh, the minimalist and mainstream scholars are going to argue for a connection with the Assyrian treaties from the first millennium, because that's going to fit their late date view. Okay. Uh, we're arguing for the connection with the Hittite treaties of the late second millennium that fits the, uh, the dates that we have uh, for Moses, either 1400 or 1200. But it doesn't have to do just with what our presuppositions are. It actually has to do with 
uh, the right stuff in the right place at the right time in terms of the structure and, and what, what's there. And we're going to look at some of that in just a minute. Okay, so let's uh, get started with that. Okay, so we're going to ask the question. I guess we need to, we'll get the next slide. There we go. Okay. Uh, is it going? Yeah, I'm trying to get it and it's not moving, so we'll, hopefully they'll help us in the back. There we go. Okay. Okay. So the mainstream scholars, they're going to argue that Mosaic Covenant, Book of Deuteronomy, Exodus 19 to 24, most closely reflects the, these Assyrian treaties from the first millennium. But what they're actually going to do, they've, they've got a specific treaty in mind. This is the Vassal Treaty of Ashurbanipal, I'm sorry, of, of Esarhaddon. It was written in 672 BC, and uh, the Assyrian king uh, promulgated it throughout the ancient Near East. And the minimalists, the mainstream scholars, are going to argue that this was the treaty. They're going to argue that a copy of this treaty came to Jerusalem and that sometime uh, in uh, 650 or so, an anonymous author or Hilkiah had seen this treaty and then wrote Deuteronomy, imitating and mirroring the structure of the uh, vassal treaty of Esarhaddon. And so this, they've got a peg then. They're going to try to argue Deuteronomy, the whole idea of, a, of God being in covenant with Israel this way, was way, way late. Okay, so they're going to try to make this. Matter of fact, uh, last year at SBL, uh, there was an entire session on Deuteronomy and ancient Near Eastern treaties, and all they talked about was VTE, the Vassal Treaty of Esarhaddon. Uh, in their mind, it's a, it's a, it's a decided issue. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's no other option in their mind, and they actually use that as a starting point in their discussions. Okay. And so what does that tell us? Uh, what, what does that tell us next? I'm still having trouble moving the slides here. Go ahead. There we go. Okay, so what they're going to argue is Deuteronomy was written as a theological polemic or as a uh, political treatise in protest of Esarhaddon's vassal treaty. What Esarhaddon did, Syrian king, he subjugated the ancient Eastern world. He then promulgated this treaty, threatening all sorts of curses if he violate the treaty and then sent it around the ancient Near East. And what they're going to argue is, is that a copy came to Jerusalem, and some loyal uh, Hebrew in Jerusalem then wrote Deuteronomy in protest against that. And they're going to argue that's why Deuteronomy looks like the Ves uh, vassal treaty of Esarhaddon. It was imitating it and, and doing a pushback against it. So it was a subtle polemic uh, against this text. It was political protest. Pro political protest, yeah. yeah. And. Uh, and again, let's move the slide again because this is, I can't get this to move forward. Um, so it's the wrong stuff and the wrong time in the wrong, well, it's the right place, but everything else. Well, it's going to be the wrong, it's going to be the wrong, wrong the wrong place, place too. Well. Yeah, okay. wrong place as well. They're going to argue it's the right stuff, right place, right time. We're going to say, uh, not, not so fast. Mm -hmm. First of all, wrong place. If we could, so you're not able to, let me, yeah. let me see if yeah, I can do ahead. this. Okay. Let me see if I've got it. There we go. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> There's a conspiracy from the back. Anyway, <laughs> there's a deep state thing going on. Anyway. <laughs> I owe you for that. Ten dollars, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, they're gonna okay, we're gonna argue no, it's the wrong place. Uh, it's true, uh, Esther Haddon did uh, promulgate this treaty, but it's actually only been found in four locations outside the Assyrian heartland at Tel Tayanat. Uh, that is uh, close to Turkey, and then in three locations in the east. It's actually been only found on the northwest border and the northeast border uh, of the Assyrian Empire. So when they argue that, and they know that it was found in these four locations, but their assumption is it was found in these four locations that were provinces of Assyria. It must have been in every province, all 70 provinces, and if it was in all 70 provinces, it surely must have been in Jerusalem. Well, that's connecting a lot of dots. It's only, we, we only know it's been found in these other four locations. So for them to argue, surely it was down in Jerusalem, that's, that's going a step too far. So we'd argue, well, not, that's, that's not a good argument. Uh, secondly, the wrong time. Of course, they're going to argue 672 BC. That fits their, that's the right time for them with their late date model of Deuteronomy. Uh, but it's the wrong time in terms of the consistent testimony of the rest of Scripture. Of course, they're not taking it seriously. So we're going to beg that question. It's also, though, though, the wrong stuff. And this is the, the major issue. When you look at ancient Near Eastern treaties and Mosaic Covenant, Mosaic Covenant's got about 10 uh, features in the structure, as well as Exodus 19 to 25 that we have up there. Uh, the Vassal Treaty of Esarhaddon has five of those in common. But that means that only about half of the material in Deuteronomy reflects 
Esther Haddon's vassal treaty. So this is the fingerprint stuff. This is the fingerprint stuff. Okay. And we're going to show in just a second uh, that uh, the the Hittite treaties it's it's an exact match. Hmm. You've got all ten of these features. Um, now, well, well, no, I'm going to push push yeah, the keep button. Going, okay. Keep going. Okay. So maximalists, uh, conservatives argue it's not the Assyrian treaties from the late period, it's the Hittite treaties from the early period. Uh, some of the leading figures on this were George Mendenhall, 1952, Meredith Klein, early 1970s, uh, Kenneth Kitchen from the 70s, and he just published a re recent major work, three volumes, about a thousand pages just a couple years ago, and then Joshua Berman, who's an Israeli scholar at bar Ilan University. And they're going to argue that when you compare the Hittite treaties with the Mosaic Covenant materials, it's almost an exact match, and it's from the very same period. So it's like we were talking about. So it's a similar elements, but they aren't necessarily in the same order. Is that not right? This, the first four or five elements are in the exact same order, okay. and then the last half is in a different order, but even Exodus and Deuteronomy change the order. Mm -hmm. And so the, it seems as if the last half of materials and treaties can be in different order, but you've got them all there. Okay. But the, the, there's a set order on the, on the first half. Okay. So let's take a look. We're going to argue right stuff, right place, right time. So here's the match with Hittite treaties on the left and Exodus and Deuteronomy on the right. And if you look, uh, look across, you see the first four are exactly the same, the exact same order, and it's all there. The last six, are, uh, all the materials are there, but it's in different order. But even in Deuteronomy and Exodus, the order uh, has been different. So those are, there's a flexibility in some of these things in terms of the order, but what you have is the same material. So if we were just looking in terms of the structure, uh, we would naturally say it, it looks like a Hittite treaty. Now the problem is, is this the right place though? And, and the reason that uh, uh, mainstream scholars don't take this more seriously is they scoff at the connection of the place. Uh, because there have been about 50 Hittite treaties discovered, and all but one were all made with uh, treaty partners that were in and around the land of Hadi, in and around the land of Turkey. So one of the questions is, how could the Hebrews and Moses, who were languishing in Egypt, how could they possibly have known what a Hittite treaty looked like? I mean, you've got to have some kind of connection. I mean, and there was no internet. And there's no internet. Yeah, and it's right. about a thousand miles away, yeah, which in yeah. the ancient world is, is, is massive amount of time. So, a matter of fact, a couple of years ago I was at SBL and was talking with a German scholar and he was asking me, he, he knew I was, had been studying Hittite at Chicago and he says, how's that coming? I was talking to him, he says, he says, you evangelicals, he says, I don't understand your fascination with Hittite treaties. And I was talking to him about the connection, he says, but, but if, even if we did believe the Hebrews were in Egypt, and he says, and I don't, he says, how could they possibly have known what Hittite treaties were like? They're all up in Hatti. That's a thousand miles away, and you know, so you know, point well taken. So that's a major issue for us. How could we? How could the Hebrews have, have possibly been familiar with what a Hittite treaty had looked like? Well, there was actually one Hittite treaty that made its way down to Egypt. I said all but one Hittite treaty was up in the land of Hatti. One made its way down to Egypt in a big way. In the year 1259 B.C. The first major international treaty that we know of, the copy of this is at the UN uh, on, on display in the foyer, hmm. the treaty between the Hittites and the Egyptians. The Hittites and the Egyptians had been at war for about 150 years fighting over a, a site called Kadesh on the Orontes River uh, on the border between Syria and Hatti. And after all this war, they finally decided to make peace. Uh, Ramesses II, well, Ewell Brenner, from those of you that know uh, <laughs> Ten Commandments, uh, Ramesses II and Hattusili III engaged in diplomatic negotiations by diplomatic correspondence over a number of months, exchanged about ten letters, and finally they decided on the terms of the treaty. Hattusili, the Hittite king, his scribes drafted the, the treaty, and they actually engraved it not on, not on clay tablets, but on silver tablet silver tablet, not a stone tablet, but a silver tablet in order to ensure its, its permanence and its perpetuity and its value, and he sent it by courier all the way down to Egypt. In the year 1259 BC, it arrived in Egypt where Pharaoh Ramesses II was in his royal palace in the city of Pyramesses, the very city where we're told the Hebrews were enslaved, and it, uh, he, he, it arrived in the year 1259 But it BC. wasn't overnight. It wasn't overnight. No. <laughs> no, it was a long journey. Yeah. So here's, here's, here's the location. Now, what's interesting about the fact that it arrived in Pyramesses, the capital of Egypt, according to Exodus chapter 1, 
Pyramuses was one of the two centers where the Hebrews exited out of Egypt during the time of Moses. Pyramuses was also one of the two cities where the Hebrews were enslaved during the enslavement and the building projects. So we've got the right place. Hmm. Uh, now, not only in the right place, but uh, the right time, recent archaeological excavations at Pyramuses and Pithom. Exodus 1 says the Hebrews were enslaved at Pyramuses and Pithom. Recent excavations at both of these sites uh, at Pyramuses by Edward Puch uh, and uh, Pithom, uh, Tel Retaba by uh, Slavomir Rezepka. Uh, they I won't ask you to spell it. I that won't name. ask you to spell it. He's a nice guy, though. I've been an email okay. correspondent. It's a really nice guy. He's a Polish guy. Uh -huh. um, they both discovered over a number of years' excavations that the building projects, mud brick building projects with slave labor, with Semitic slaves, began around uh, 1320 BC uh, under the pharaoh Horemheb, and the building projects were completed in the middle of the reign of Ramesses II around 1250 BC. So the, the Silver Treaty arriving in Egypt at 1259 BC is right in the middle of the time period where the archaeologists tell us that the two cities that the, that the Bible says the Hebrews were involved in building, those still building projects were 1320 down to 1250. So you got the right stuff in the right place at the right time. It's an amazing match uh, when you think about it. Now, how publicized would have this kind of stuff have been? Well, I'm glad you asked about that. <laughs> uh, not only was it, uh, now, now in, typically in the ancient Near Eastern world, conventional practice was when a treaty was made, it would be read to the king, and then the king would have the copy of the treaty put in his royal archives, never to be seen again, and another copy put in the temple before, uh, in, the, in the Holy of Holies, in the temple before the deity, never to be seen again. Typically, the contents of treaties were only known to the king and to the royal court. But Ramesses II broke convention in this case. He was so proud of the fact that he had navigated and negotiated the first ma known major international treaty between two major powers that he displayed it all over the place. He put it on public display in a temple in the north in Heliopolis, and then he had uh, his Egyptian scribes carve copies of the treaty onto the outside walls of two temples in the south. Now, in ancient Egypt, uh, th the way that they uh, 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 promulgated the royal literature was not in books, but on the walls of buildings the walls of their, of their temples. This is ENN. This is, that's right. <laughs> so, well, think of the George Bush Museum that we have, or the George Bush Library we have at SMU. It's not a library for books, it really is a display building mm -hmm. with all sorts of plaques for public viewing. And this is, and Ramesses was so proud of this, he wanted everybody in Egypt to know about that. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but he also wrote a letter to Hatu Shili after he received the treaty, and he told him, he reported to him, that not only had he put this treaty on display in the north temple of Heliopolis and had it engraved on the walls of the two temples in the south, but he had his scribes go out, go out throughout the land of Egypt and have it read publicly to both great and small all throughout the land of Egypt. Hmm. This likely would have been the best known treaty in ancient Near Eastern history. Facebook. Facebook. Mm -hmm. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here's where it was at. It was put on display in the north. Pyramuses were the place it was delivered. Karnak and Ra the Ramuseum in the south were, was put on display, and then from north to south, his scribes read this. Now, the reason he wanted the scribes to read it to, to the populace, he wanted, he wanted his reputation to be promulgated as this great king, but he also wanted them to know that they were in, uh, that they were in treaty with, uh, with the Hittites. So it would have been very, very well known. Hmm. So where does that leave us? Well. It leaves us the right, uh, here I'll show you a picture of this. This is, this is the public display, the Ramazeum, the wall you can see. Uh, uh, and um, So what we have is the right place, uh, 1259, it's the right time, right place, right, pla uh, uh, right stuff. It fits within the time of one of the two options we have uh, for date of the Exodus and date of Sinai. Now, as far as evangelicals, we debate inter, kind of an intramural, friendly intramural discussion between what we call the early and late date. Now, as far as mainstream, we're all really, really early, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just the early, early, or the late, early date mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the public square discussion. But it gives, it, it's one of the two options that we have. Uh, and so uh, if, we're, if we're willing to go with the 1250 date for the Exodus or thereabouts, it really fits, and it would help to explain how 
uh, Mosaic Covenant would so closely resemble uh, this Hittite material. So, um, so, so what does that mean in terms of, of what it is that we're saying here in terms of the way to engage on this? Okay, so what we're, the, the point being, uh, for uh, most of your people that uh, uh, are, uh, uh, most of your folks in the church, uh, you, this is not going to be something that you can preach on Sunday morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please, please don't do that. Um, but when you go to Barnes and Noble's bookstore, watch Mysteries of the Bible, read Time and Newsweek, this is what is behind all the stuff about Moses is a myth, Moses is legend, the Exodus is, le is, is mythological, Sinai really happened. The minimalist view is what's, what's behind all that. And that's not just involved with people who may go to church or certain kinds of churches. There are people who are hearing this in the public square period. Public square. When your kids go off to college, mm -hmm. go to universities, uh, go to Christian colleges, uh, unless they're very, very conservative, they're going to be they're going to hear about JDP, Documentary Hypothesis. Uh, the Documentary Hypothesis is based upon dating D, Deuteronomy, to, to 650, 620. So this is all the core for this. Uh, so our point is not necessarily that you go out and learn Hittite and learn about these treaties, but just to know that we've got some, we've got a valid case that we got the right stuff in the right place at the right time. Uh, that uh, uh, you can you can make an argument that Mosaic Covenant does fit within an Egyptian background at a time period where one of our two options where we could put Moses in the Hebrews. And it's exact right stuff. It's hard not to walk away from the DNA, not to be impressed by that by that match. All right. So um, we've got mics here, by the way. So in case you have questions about just general apologetics approaches to Old Testament and that kind of thing, feel free to to step up. Um, and as, as you're as anyone wants to ask questions, what we're bottom line, what we're suggesting is, and this is kind of we're trying to be cutesy here. But by simply comparing the Hittite treaty that was inscribed in a silver tablet with the Mosaic Covenant, which is inscribed on stone tablets, we can serve up historical Moses on a silver platter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, he's been reading Hittite for a long time. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> this is what you do on sabbatical. You get into this lame academic humor. Exactly Don't right. Don't try this at home. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, I won't retell the story of Sally taking four of us out to an ETS meeting. Well, I'm going to retell it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we're all joking in the back, and all the jokes have to deal with their word place on Hebrew and word place on Greek. And my, my wife driving us to the airport and turns back and says, I have just spent 45 minutes not understanding a single word you all have been saying to one another. <laughs> so, uh, so welcome to our world, That's right? right? That's right. And in terms of the pay, just an application of payoff as well, uh, how would the Hebrews in Egypt have known what it's going to be like to be in covenant with God? Deuteronomy itself says this has never happened before. There's never been a God that's ever reached into time and space and has rescued a people from the middle of another nation, brought them to himself, and, and, and made a covenant with them. So how are you to understand this? And what God did, we think, is that he used something in their culture that they understood, a, an ancient Near Eastern treaty, in, the, in a treaty that, that they would have been familiar with, more than likely, the, the most well-known, most publicized treaty in the ancient Near Eastern world. And Yahweh essentially was saying, it's kind of like this. Uh, that treaty that you saw between uh, the, these two powers, the Egyptians and the, and the Hittites, it's like that. But I'm, I'm the sovereign. I'm, I'm the overlord, and you're my servant. Yeah, and, and another application out of this is um, the idea of the covenant relationship that exists. We, as you all know, we've been doing a series on world religions in the podcast. And when we come to, to Islam in particular, which has a very strong view of a sovereign God and a very strong view of... Uh, of the submission to this sovereign God, what is the missing dimension in Islam that exists in both Judaism and Christianity is this covenant relationship, this personal relational connection between God and his people. Uh, and so here is a historically rooted, uh, long established connection uh, that has this as a part of what's going on. Okay, we've got we've got one person who's brave enough to ask a question, so you're, you're on. So we know that uh, this minimalism is very popular in secular circles, but are there very many uh, mainline Christian uh, circles that um, that believe in this uh, minimalism who also believe in the authenticity of uh, Jesus Christ as Messiah? That's a great question. It's it. Uh, 
What often happens in Old Testament circles is that people might start uh, letting go of Moses and the Exodus, and they may ask the question, what does it matter? I mean, just Moses and just the Exodus. Uh, but then as time goes on, they begin to realize that Moses and the Exodus was the foundation for Israel's faith, and the Exodus was God's great saving act in which he showed that he was the one true living God. Uh, and that living God then proclaimed that one day there'd be a Messiah, and if Jesus' messianic claim and who he is is based upon Old Testament hope and expectation, it doesn't, it, it's not too long when somebody lets go of Moses that they begin to let go of Jesus as well. Thank you very much for the information. I'd like to ask, what are the minimalists basing their research on, their findings? So they're, they're looking at these ancient Near Eastern texts very seriously. Uh, most of them are actually more involved in scholarship and research on these ancient Christian texts than most evangelicals and conservatives. We tend to put all of our focus on, on scripture itself, of course. Uh, but what they're focusing on is the ancient Christian material, but they really have an agenda. They have got presuppositions. They're not going to take seriously uh, the second millennium Hittite connection and a second millennium background with Israel in Egypt, because in their mind, that's myth and that's legend. They just don't take it seriously. Part of, and to be honest, part of the thing is there's an anti-supernatural bias. They're trying to explain the origin of the Bible, the origin of Israel, and the origin of Israel's traditions apart from God actually intervening in history. And so what they have is they've got a history of religions approach. And for them, if they can explain how we got the Bible with this connection with the Assyrians on a late date, that fits their model when you start talking about but this connection in back in Egypt, in their mind, they don't want to go there because that points to the idea that Israel really was in Egypt, there really was an Exodus, there really was Sinai, there really was a revelation of God at Sinai, and they just don't want to go there. Okay, so I have a, a two-fold question. Uh, one, since the Hebraic script was, um, that we know of today was formed, during the exile in the Aramaic square script. How do we essentially get the, the data to know that what's behind the text is actually older than that? And how do we also um, go against a thought that I've heard popping up what, uh, saying that since we don't have the Hebrew text, any copies of the Hebrew text in its original form since it was all modified by the scribes during the exiles. How can we, you know, have trust in the Hebrew scripts and manuscripts that we currently have? Fair question. Okay, so that, that's uh, two things. One about the script and one about the manuscripts. Uh, the Hebrew square script that we have in the Hebrew Bible today, it's Aramaic square script. But the, the script that the Hebrews had before the exile was what we call the, the, the Paleo-Hebrew script. And we actually have extra biblical inscriptions going back to about 1000 BC uh, in the land of Canaan, land of Israel. Uh, there was a, the so-called Hatef Hinnom inscription that was found by Gabriel Barkai about a decade and a half ago uh, in the area of Jerusalem. We actually found a, a portion of Numbers, is it chapter 5, the high priestly mm -hmm. blessing. Uh, that was found in a silver amulet in the Paleo-Hebrew script dating to about the 7th century BC, that you have somebody that's so prizing the high pri priestly blessing that we have in Numbers chapter 5 that they're actually wearing it around their neck in some amulet. So we know at, at the very least that, 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 that we've got some objective evidence that there were portions of scriptures uh, before the exile. Uh, we wish that we had more archaeological evidence of more manuscripts before that, but we do know that we had, we've got material that was before that. So the, so the other question is that since the script is radically different, how do we um, effectively analyze its meaning since it's a completely, essentially a completely different language? Well, it's the, the difference between the script and the language. Uh, right now, I can tell you this, in, I think it's Croatia, they're shifting over from uh, the old traditional script uh, that they had, and they're now converting to a Latin script. My son was telling me about this yesterday, so this is my 
senior in high school <laughs> his help on this. And he was saying, Dad, you know, they're changing the entire language. How could they do that? And we looked up and, they, and it was simply, they were just going from one script to the other script. It would not be dissimilar from going from a cursive English script to a block English script. It's, it's the same basic letters, it's just written in, in different form. So that's a, that's a great question. All right. Is there, uh, I'm, I'm being signaled from the back about questions being texted in with the text up there. Unfortunately, I didn't set myself up to do it, so, but she's, <laughs> ah, but Kimberly is coming to the rescue. I just need help today. Um, so, so you ah. read the text. Ah, texting questions. Okay, let's see. Um, how have the minimalist scholars responded to the Hittite Treaty research? What's been interesting is that they've been, they've been uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, they were very engaged with it because it, uh, it was really putting pressure on their minimalist uh, agenda. And that's when they really started pressing toward the Assyrian materials. Uh, Kenneth Kitchen, I mentioned before, he spent the last 30, 35 years dealing with this, published a three volume, thousand page uh, magnus, magnum opus uh, to try to get all the material out there. Um, and basically what the minimalists have done is they've simply ignored it. Um, they, they've chosen to ignore it. Um, and uh, even at SBL last year, the, the Hittite material wasn't even on the radar screen for them. Because in their mind, it'd be like, uh, like if somebody said, well, what do, you, you know, what do you think about the Martians, you know, the UFOs that have come visit us? It's, it's a conversation in their mind, they're not even gonna engage because it's like, you know, you believe in, in UFOs. Hmm. Uh, is the argument that Moses saw the treaty in Egypt, how would the majority of Hebrews recognize the covenant with God mirrored this to an extent? Could the Hebrew slaves see and understand the text on the wall? That's a great question. Uh, so what we're arguing is not necessarily that the Hebrews themselves had to have seen it or been able to read it. Uh, some of them might have heard it uh, proclaimed to them by the scribes. It would have been part of the culture. Uh, Ramesses was pushing the whole thing. And we're not even suggesting that Moses has necessarily got a copy of it and trying to, to make a copy of it, but is more the idea that Moses may likely have absorbed the concepts of the treaty and been familiar with the kind of things that you would have in this kind of a treaty and absorbed it more cognitively as part of his DNA and then used that to communicate rather than having to have a copy in front of them. I think it's hard to um, appreciate the fact that when you're dealing with ancient history and ancient historiography and documents like this because we're so used to writing and we're so used to digital formats. It's more of an oral. It's much more of an oral culture. So that what you retain and what you hear and what you experience comes across from what you have heard and what you retain through your memory than, uh, than from any other you know written form or something like that. So. Um, it's, ju it's just a different way of doing it. We have the same problems in the New Testament when it comes to the issue of Jesus. You know, you've got, uh, you've got a 30 plus year gap between, at, at least, between the event and the writing down of the first Gospels. If you're dealing with the Gospel of John, it's almost twice that length. It's almost 60 years. And so, you know, a lot of scholars will play with that material in between and say, oh, well, a lot of stuff could have happened in there. But what it doesn't recognize is the way in which oral tradition works and the way in which oral tradition uh, operates in the context of, of things. And that, that's a different dynamic uh, in terms of what's going on. Even with treaties, uh, the uh, Hittite Egyptian treaty was the first one that was read publicly to the people. But many treaties in the ancient Near Eastern world, at least Hittite treaties, required the vassal king to have had the treaty read to him. Most of them didn't read cuneiform, but their scribes did, and so the scribe would read the treaty to the, to the vassal king and required it to be read to him on a regular basis, at least once a year. Uh, with Ramesses actually tells us in his letter to Hattushili that he had the treaty read to him, okay, and then he had it written uh, uh, on, on the, uh, the walls of these temples and then had it read to the people, okay, and then had it put in this, this temple. And so that was the primary way that people had a treaty communicated to them was having a scribe read it to the people that were not, not that very literate. What's interesting, at Sinai, Yahweh spoke the words of the treaty to Israel from Sinai and they heard the words. Then Yahweh had Moses come up on the mountain where he gave them the book of the covenant and Moses read that to the people. 
Okay, in the book of Deuteronomy, we're told that Moses wrote these speeches, and then he read the speeches to Israel, handed the scrolls to the priest, and told them, hold on to these, and on a regular basis, take these scrolls out and read these to the people. And the people were then to pledge their loyalty. So even this is part of, of what, what that culture was. They would have been used to having a, a, a treaty or a covenant read to them. Yeah, it's, it's very, uh, the whole issue of literacy in ancient, in ancient times is a much discussed subtopic that you rarely hear about. But there's only a very small percentage of people who can, who can write and who work with documents. So, and that kind of relieves us from the burden of having to say, would the Hebrews have seen this and read this? Would they have to have known Egyptian? Would Moses have had to have seen it? it? It would have been talked about and heard. Last question. Um, how important is validating the early exodus to Jewish scholars? In other words, um, uh, we talked about what the reception is amongst the min minimalists. What's going on in Jewish scholarship with these guys? Well, of they're things? all over the place as well. I mean, one would think that it's in their national history that they would be all on board with this, but there's minimalist and maximalist within, within Jewish circles as well. Uh, Joshua Berman in bar Ilan University is one of the few places where there really is a more of a maximalist uh, sense to it. We would call it conservative, not evangelical conservative, but, but Jewish historical conservative. Uh, but at Tel Aviv University, where Finkelstein and others are, they, they, they take a minimalist approach and they would like to debunk the Bible because they feel like the Bible, the biblical claims on the land of Israel are actually getting in, 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 uh, uh, getting in the way of, of, of peace talks. Well, which is a whole other dimension of this conversation, which is how people make use of this material. Unfortunately, our time's up. So let me close this in a while. Let's thank Dr. Johnson for his I'll close this in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for uh, your goodness and grace, for your involvement in our lives, that you um, have stepped into history. You not only did it in, in having the word become flesh, but you prepared the way for that action by what took place even centuries before. And you've left little footprints and fingerprints in the sand uh, around that. So we pray that we might uh, take what we hear reflect upon it, um, sense your goodness and your involvement, uh, not just in our own lives, but your, in the lives of people across the centuries. We marvel when we consider all the work over all the centuries that allowed for the preservation of your word so that we can read it and study it. May we never take your care for granted. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.